daylight freaking savings time. Oh my God. That's all I have to say. Usually what happens is no one comes. After daylight savings time shifts, that's usually like four people. So thank you for being here. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I always just kind of feel like, what are we doing, man? It's like, you know, like both ways, like this way I like better than the other way, but I still don't like it that much. Um, anyway, I won't kvetch all that. But, yeah. um, so, uh, Gigi is on my, last week we talked about the Samadhi of the Tathagata, and then um, tonight um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, the uh, three poisons, the ten uh, realms, and um, and we're going to go a little bit into um, what, uh, how do I say it? So there's a way in which, in Buddhist teachings, where uh, there's frameworks for things, or there's kind of like, um, uh, there are the three thises and the four thats and the ten thises and the 16 <laughs> aspects of the this and the that and everything. And Buddhism has a lot of that. Um, uh, a lot of that comes out of the Indian tradition, um, the origins of, of uh, Buddhism in uh, South Asia, where that kind of, uh, kind of outlines are really um, uh, foundational to the way a lot of things work. And then that traveled along uh, with, uh, with Buddhism. And then it, it takes this kind of turn, particularly in a lot of the Chinese Mahayana uh, interpretations of those lists where rather than just being lists of discrete things there's a lot of emphasis or a lot of attention paid to how they all interrelate and so the interrelation of those lists become um, a lot of what the discussion is about and if these parts of Menzon's um, uh, teaching that you've been reading where he's he's referencing a lot of those lists and talking about how they um, are really, they're talking about the same thing from different angles or they're, or they're talking about how to interpenetrate. And that's a, it's a, it's a kind of skill to learn how to relate to those, um, that, those kinds of teachings. And it's a good skill to develop because a lot of really profound things come from um, being able to uh, encounter that kind of uh, saying, it's kind of all one, there's 15 facets of it, and if it's all, if there's 15 facets of this thing that is one, then each of the facets' relationship with each other is going to be something other than just like a, a simple relationship between two things. It's going to be a discussion about how they're not really different. Does that make sense? Like they're all part of this gem. And the gem has all these different facets, and you might focus on one facet or the other facet, and you could compare. You could say maybe this one's refracting the light a little bit this way, and this one's refracting the light a little bit this way. You could compare how they're the same or different. But ultimately, the, the conversation's going to go down to how they are uh, the same in a fundamental way, even though they appear in a totally different way. So they're both different and the same at the same time. That's the kind of um, place that the, that the discussion of those... Uh, different lists and things go. So anyway, I hope I didn't build up too much. Um, that's uh, um, part of where we're going to go tonight. And it starts with this question on page 31, where after uh, Menzan talks about the uh, samadhi of the Tathagata and again makes a, a strong, I don't know if he makes a strong case for it. He's insistent on its importance. Um, and then he comes to this question, uh, which is, you know, I never quite like this device in any kind of philosophical writing or theological writing where someone asks a question that's not really a question, they just use it as a way to be able to answer something. Um, having said that, um, we got to deal with it because he used the device. But he only used it once, whereas Dogen uses it like 18 times. Um, maybe by the time it gets to our generation, we can dispense. But. So the question is, if we admit the light and open our eyes to the reality which is beyond arising mind, thoughts, and no mind, no thought, then do we, how do you say that, annihilate? Annihilate. Annihilate. Oh, gosh. I know that word. I didn't know it was spelled <laughs> like that. Um, then uh, do we annihilate the good and bad functions of the three poisonous minds? Explain this in detail. <laughs> Quite a question. So 
the first thing I think is why this question? You know, why did he choose this um, as the question to uh, lead us into this conversation of the three poisonous minds? And if you look up just above there in the first full paragraph of, um, of that page 31, he says, we must understand that this is the culmination of the Buddha way and the unsurpassable samadhi which is continuously going beyond. And so he's making this case that the samadhi, this jiju zamaida samadhi of self-receiving, employing um, this illumination of the jewel, etc., 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 it's constantly going beyond. And so I think that what he wants to do is clarify what does he mean by going beyond? It's so easy to think of going beyond as um, the thought realm, uh, this, this, this realm of all the worlds, which we'll go into here in a second, is just basically going beyond. It's like getting out. Right? And this is foundational to most um, Asian religions that originated in South Asia. The idea that we're in a, a, a life of transmigration, which means we're going around and around and around and around in a circle, and that the solution to that is to get out, is to get off. And interpretations within Buddhism, as well as interpretations within other religions that originated in South Asia, that's oftentimes the interpretation. And although it has some strengths, it also has some really serious weaknesses. And I think Menzon's trying to warn us about this simplistic way of understanding is really going to cause problems um, in practice and isn't going to really lead us to what it is that we're looking for, which is liberation. It might lead to no thought. Um, it might lead to a kind of shutting everything down. But he's saying that's not what the Buddha's trying to do. The Buddha's not trying to shut everything down. The, Buddha, the Buddha's trying to help um, everything uh, wake up to the freedom of uh, being as opposed to the kind of suffering we normally um, are experiencing. So, um, so I think it's important for us to see how in Zen there is this kind of attitude. Often we hear teachings like um, to go beyond good and evil, right? or um, you know, it's not about it of making things better. It's about liberation. Right? Now, I think those are really good teachings. I say those things. Um, and I believe those things, and I'm happy when I hear those things. But I think oftentimes those very kind of true, important pointers are um, mistaken. They're mistaken as a kind of dismissal, that to say go beyond good and evil means like, oh, any notion of good and evil is just stupid, and we should just uh, uh, be free by not worrying about good and evil and just doing whatever we want. That's not what it means. It means that if we're trapped in good and evil, um, we're still within this samsaric cycle and there's some other possibility, which is different than just being kind of uh, uh, like, like, a, mm, kind of self-centered acting out and just having, being able to say there's no good and evil self and I don't have to worry about anything. Right? Now this you could see really a lot of confusion in that as Zen came into the West where um, satori, satori is the way it's said in Japanese, but satori was really celebrated, and a lot of people thought satori meant that you were going to wake up, that was beyond good and evil, and then you could do whatever you wanted. And there was this kind of wild sense. Now, we have ancestors who've done wild things, and it's an expression of a certain kind of freedom, but um, there's always this conundrum of, um, of karma, and that we can't be free of... Um, Karma. We don't get to just sidestep that. So, um, so I think that's the realm that Menzon's working in here um, quite a bit. So then he goes into this explanation, which is on page, you know, kind of thirty-two and thirty-three, which uh, you know, you're reading and you can read, uh, you can read again later. What I want to do is take that information and I want to kind of break it out into these lists that I was talking about a little bit because um, because he he mentions a lot of things. I bet you. Why don't you feel like that? Can you guys see? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let me try to try to brighten a little bit. So 
the first thing that he's referencing is about these ten, uh, these ten realms. Oftentimes, when we talk about it here, we usually talk about the six realms. And um, those uh, uh, six realms, I'm going to try to write it in the in the order that he does. It's not the normal right. It's not the normal way that I would write it. Um, so hungry ghosts. So, um, this is what we usually refer to as the, as the six rounds. And earlier on in Menzon, he did talk a little bit about how the three poisons relate with these rounds. And the three poisons, we usually use the terms in this temple, greed, hate, and delusion. But um, greed, anger, and ignorance is the way Okumura Roshi um, translates those. We usually use hate and delusion. Same word in Chinese and in the Sanskrit, but just different translators translate it in a little bit different way. So earlier on, you'll remember towards the beginning of the text, he was saying greed, when it's in its negative form, um, so these are the negative forms, produces the realm of hungry ghosts, the insatiable appetite that can never be um, satisfied. And these beings just roam, uh, roam in hunger. That anger um, is the hell realm. Kill or be killed. Constant um, uh, dismemberment. And ignorance leads to the realm of animals. So a kind of instinctual life, no seeing of a possibility for there to be some other way. And that those same three, that in their positive elements, give us the humans, Ashuras, and Devas are gods. So humans are related with greed, Ashuras with anger, and the Devas are the gods with ignorance. So humans are very practical. We're greedy, but we make things better. That's our big, that's a thing that we do. And that's good, basically, he's saying. That's a positive aspect of greed. Um, it's not liberated, but it's a positive aspect of greed. Ashuras use the same hate or the anger to um, express what is true. And oftentimes, like, what is um, necessary or what is just. And the devas, or gods, um, live in a state of, um, of uh, contentment but it's a forgetful contentment. Right? So again, these are all positive, um, but they're still based in the three poisons. So this is the way we usually talk about it, the six realms, but there's four more, and the four more go beyond that transmigration realm, and they're the, um, they're the Shravakas, and the Pracheka Bhuttas, Sorry, this is getting smaller. And we've talked about those earlier because he brings those up a lot. These collectively are known as the two vehicles. And in Mahayana Buddhism, they're a punching bag, um, generally speaking. They're, they represent two approaches to the Dharma, which Menzong really emphasizes expressing this way, are trying to get out of this. They're trying to get out of this wheel right, of, of this transmigration. And so what they do is they reject all of it and they try to dry up all of the greed, hate, and delusion which fuels this process. The Shravakas do it by listening to the teachings of the Buddha, Shakyamuni, and trying to implement them in a process of drying up all of their passions and so that they become arhats. That's the path of the Shravaka. The Pracheka Buddhas are come sometimes called isolated Buddhas or solitary Buddhas. They're beings who have woken up through keen observation 
and oftentimes they're talked about as following the 12 link chain of dependent origination. And through a deep understanding of the 12 link chain of dependent origination, they're able to escape this, but they just escape it. They don't get liberated. That would be the Mahayana perspective. They're isolated and, they, and as such, they can't really help other beings. Um, because they're just in a kind of isolated, they've solved the problem in a way, but they've solved it in an isolated way. So those are the seventh and eighth. And then you have the bodhisattvas and Buddhas. So at this level, the ninth and the tenth, then we start talking about liberation, right? where this whole kit and kabuto is what the practice is about. Okay. Um, this is, so this is one of those lists, uh, those 10. So um, I'll just mention this briefly for those of you who have studied this before, but it's, um, it's a little, it, uh, Menzon is one of those people, this oftentimes happens from very, very prolific writers, is he's an organizer of thoughts. And so, He's going to try to organize as many things into this as possible. Any of you who have read commentary by Fatsong in China, he is like the godfather of godfathers of this. And I think Menzon is kind of in that same path where he's trying to reconcile all of these different teachings and they do it through this kind of matrix. So he also mentions in there the way in which the three poisons give rise to the three worlds of uh, sense desire, form, and no form. And he, it's kind of an interesting thing. I haven't read it anywhere else where he says greed gives rise to the, um, the, the realm of sense desire and anger gives rise to the sense of form and ignorance gives uh, rise to the, um, the world of no form. Um, and uh, that maps on in a, lot of, in a lot of ways, but we won't talk too much about it. But to say that you oftentimes will hear this we hear like the six realms and the three worlds. The three worlds, these are said to be all within the realm of the three worlds. And that's the realm of form, no form, and sense desire. But almost always, in, at least in Soto Zen Buddhism, when you hear the word three worlds, you will hear three worlds are one mind. And this is what uh, Dogen goes to, or uh, Menzon goes to right away. He says that um, all of these realms are simply the functioning of one mind. Right? And so to try to escape it uh, isn't the point. Trying to escape it just turns, it just turns into taking refuge in no thought, right, is, is the translation so if this greed, anger, and ignorance is thought, right, that if we're trying to just get away from this transmigration, which is all based in greed, ang uh, anger, and <coughs> ignorance, we'll just do this thing, which the Srivakas and Prachekabhutas think of as enlightenment, but it's really just escape. And that escape is totally conditioned by greed, anger, and ignorance. It's a fear of greed, anger, and ignorance, which leads to this escape. So the escape is, is still, it's still based in a rejection. If it's based in a rejection, then it's conditioned. If it's conditioned, it's not um, completely free. That's the kind of theology uh, that's happening there. So this escape, you'll hear, you'll hear him talking about it as no thought. He says, they just take refuge in uh, no thought, and that refuge in no thought, thought is just basically the same thing as taking refuge in thought. It's conditioned in exactly the same way. It's just the, it's just the transverse uh, of it. So when I first read this, um, you know, I was like, okay, okay, all this work, you know, ideas organized, that, that can be helpful in some ways. Helps me remember it. Um, so that's one thing, but what do you do? Um, who, uh, who really cares? I think the parts of it that were meaningful to me, and you'll have your own things that are meaningful to you, and 
that would come out of it. The first was on this layer of seeing that greed, anger, and ignorance are not bad in the way that I'm conditioned to think of things as bad and good. So I hear greed, anger, and ignorance, or greed, hate, and delusion. I'm like, bad. How do I get it out of me? How do I get it away? How do I escape from it? That's going to be the mark of something that's, that's, uh, that, that's the path. And that's how I'll know the path because I'm less greedy, less hateful, I'm not as deluded. Right? And um, while that has, a, that has a role to play, it's very, very limited. And especially just on the level of most people who are kind of spiritually inclined. I mean, no one forces you to come to the temple on Thursday night um, other than your own um, sense of what you want to do with your life. And you could be your biggest kind of um, you know, finger wagger at, your, at yourself. Um, and that's one of the biggest problems in our, in our spiritual lives is that we're, um, we're kind of both whipping ourselves and thinking of ourselves as a kind of superior being at the same time. And um, this really directly challenges. It says, yeah, you're deluded. Thank God. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then from that place, something is possible. This goes back to the donkey staring in the well. The, that poem that, um, that I was so excited about a few uh, a few weeks ago. So I want to call your attention to this line on. It's the last few lines, page thirty-two, in the first full paragraph, the only full, full paragraph. It starts there in the middle of the page. It says, the three poisonous minds are arise within the functions of one mind. Okay, that's what I was, I was saying. If we go to the end of that paragraph, three lines up. He says, they call this depart from life and death. Okay, he's talking about the, the, uh, um, the Pracheka Buddhas and the Shravakas. But this is not the same as being free from life and death, as is the emancipation of the Tathagata. Right? So that's what he's talking about here. The difference with, between trying to be free from life and death, this is this transmigration here is the shorthand for it is life and death, which is the way that samsara is written in Chinese. Samsara means cyclical existence. And in Chinese, you just write the characters for life and death. So he's saying that, uh, that uh, being, um, uh, uh, what were the terms he uses here? Um, escaping, of uh, the departure, okay? So he's saying this departure, I use the word escape, right, is not the same as freedom from life and death. Or I would go so far as to say freedom as life and death. Because that's what the Bodhisattva's path is about. Right? It's not a rejection of these worlds. It's a freedom that is right there as those worlds or in those worlds. Um, it's not going someplace else. And this is really core to the Mahayana in general, but particularly to, to, um, to Zen teaching. This term liberation... Um, is uh, uh, is really important word. It's a it's a translation of the word uh, vimoksa or um, gedatsu in the Japanese pronunciation of the Chinese, and we use in English liberation. But to think about that word as a kind of technical Buddhist word, I think is um, is important because it, we start building an idea of what we're talking about with liberation is not just being an escape from. Right? It's not just a freedom from, but a freedom to. You see the difference in that language there? I'm always escaping on the freedom from. I don't, it's hard to understand the freedom to, the freedom to do something. And that's more um, what we're trying to um, focus on. Now this can all go back, I've made it as a list. We can also go back to the circle that I keep um, drawing each class and talking about it as the, as the mirror, which reflects everything. Classical iconography 
greed, hate, and delusion are here. And then the negative realms here, animals, hell realm, hungry ghosts, humans, Asuras, and um, divine beings. This kind of, like, people have seen this iconography before? Yeah. So I'm just kind of telling you, reminding of you what it's like. And if you remember, this, this mirror gets held by our... I know you guys wait every week for my artwork. <laughs> and he's got his hands like this. This is Lord Yama. And Lord Yama is the... Usually his feet are sticking out here like this. He's holding this. He's holding this mirror. And he's the um, Lord of life and death. Okay, oftentimes referred to as the Lord of death because we're alive, so that's what he looks like to us. <laughs> and um, and, this, and this, trans, this transmigration. But uh, one of the beautiful things about how the story of this, what's happening with Lord Yama, is he's not a bad guy. Right? He's the one who holds the mirror of karma. Mm. And so while you're transmigrating, what happens is you look into the mirror and when you look into the mirror you see your karma and seeing your karma is where your rebirth will take place right? if we think about that in the term of like the lifespan of a human and then our physical body dies and there's a, there's a continuation of the life into other lives um, that's one way to understand it you know, your physical body dies and you travel with other parts of your bodies and you meet this, um, uh, this Lord Yama, and the mirror is your karma, and you show up in another place. Okumura Roshi, in his notes, emphasizes that we can also understand all these realms as, he says, psychological states, which I don't like all that much, but, you know, it's probably fine. Um, and uh, that is that it's immediate experience, that we're transmigrating all the time. We don't have to die to transmigrate. We are in a total process of transmigration all the time. And the world's a mirror. So guess what? When you're looking around, uh, you're, you're not just seeing what is. You're seeing uh, karma. And so this then sets up the possibility of what it is to practice where delusion and um, awakening are not divided. That what you experience as a moment-to-moment concrete reality is diluted um, but it's also that's all it is it's not a problem it's not hindered and so we can practice right there with with uh, amidst that delusion or we can even say set up that delusion as practice as we do with our body and, um, in zazen So at the bottom of page 32 then, he says that what our work with our work is is clearly illuminating. Right, that next paragraph. He says, the way of great bodhisattvas is different. The basis of transmigration is nothing other than our own mind, i.e. the mirror of living. That's another way we could say our own mind. Furthermore, when we clearly illuminate our mind and realize that this mind is nothing but a phantom and that we cannot grasp the mind by thoughts or discrimination using concepts such as existence or non-existence, we no longer try to either annihilate mind nor nurture it. So this term clearly illuminate, um, you, you know, uh, many of you will be familiar with that term as... Um, uh, Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva, clearly seeing that all five aggregates are empty, thus relieved all suffering. That's exactly the same term. Here he translates it as clearly illuminate, um, but it's clearly seeing. So it's illuminated seeing, clear seeing. He says that's what the practice is. It's not escape from these worlds. It's a clear seeing. It's a not just being transfixed in what the images that we see are, but also learning to uh, uh, just illuminate them directly without futzing between them, being like, 
oh, there's a war between the, the gods and the, um, and the titans and getting all caught up in that drama. But um, uh, being able to accept that both have their, um, their place. And then he says something super, I think, is, is a very uh, profound and kind of hard to get. And that's at the bottom of that paragraph I was just reading. It's the, on page 33, that partial paragraph, that, you know, the one that ends there. At the end of that paragraph, um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven lines up from the bottom. It's right in the middle. He says, when we just illuminate our mind without adding thoughts and discrimination, the three poisonous minds of anger, greed, and ignorance also have the nature of being dropped off. That is, of being beyond discrimination and being ungraspable. The three poisonous minds are not a bit different from the eternal Dharma body of the Tathagata. So, this three poisonous minds are ungraspable is really, really key to this clear seeing. Because oftentimes what we do is we say, we say, okay, clear seeing means I'm going to see through or around or somehow get rid of the deluded thoughts. Like we're just, we're so, we're so enamored with that idea that we'll just come to that again and again and again. Even though if we read carefully what Men's on saying, he says, no, it's not about that, it's not about that, it's not about that, not about that. and we'll even believe him. But then when we go to sit down, we'll be like, why can't I get rid of these damn thoughts? <laughs> like that will be, that will be our, our reaction there, okay? So that, the, this, this teaching I think is really important there. He says that those, all of those thoughts, all of that stuff, greed, hate, and delusion, and all of those worlds based in greed, hate, and delusion is ungraspable. And because it's ungraspable, it's of the nature of being dropped off. Dropped off is a kind of important word within Soto Zen. That's what Dogen's awakening experience was said to be when his teacher was saying in the meditation hall, body and mind dropped off. And he had, a, he had a, a, an opening at that point that allowed him to see things in a different way. A lot of scholars think he probably misunderstood what his teacher said, but that's another story. Um, so um, the, uh, plus there's scholars. They're always making trouble. Um, but uh, but uh, this dropped offedness right, is not escape. The dropped offedness is the ungraspability of all those things. No matter how much you try to invest in your delusion, it will not satisfy you, nor will it stay put, nor will it be permanent enough that you will be able to rely upon it which is super frustrating when you invest in the delusion, but it's also the kindness of the delusion that it won't actually um, satisfy you. If it would satisfy you, then you're screwed, right? Because you're, now you're just hooked into it, but it won't. And so all these things which we label as suffering in this worlds of transmigration are actually important for us. Right? It's important that we live and die. Loss is really hard and Without it, we're sunk, right? So that kind of eternalist mind that is really strong inside of us is trying to, is trying to nail those things down. Um, but men's on here, he's saying like, look, don't, don't hate the greed, hate, and delusion. Don't try to get away from it because it is not graspable, just like everything else. It's really core Mahayana teaching that everything is empty, even those teachings are empty. That doesn't mean reject them and try to get out. It means that actually a deep kind of acceptance where the totality of them um, becomes, you know, really important. And he goes so far as to say that it's the eternally abiding, actually, I don't know why he translated it the way he did. I, I like a little bit of better, eternally abiding Dharma body of the Tanakh. So then this next paragraph, I just want to read the thing. He says, when we thoroughly realize that the three poisonous minds are nothing but the eternal Dharma body of the Tathagata, it becomes obvious that all sentient beings transmigrating in the six realms also have the nature of this eternal Dharma body and lack nothing. Since we understand this reality, we arouse Bodhi mind 
and vow to lead all sentient beings to the eternal Dharma body of the Tathagata. This is carrying out the practice enlightenment of a Bodhisattva. So waking up to this uh, dropped offness, the clear seeing of the, um, of the poisons, changes our aspiration. And that's the very thing he said on the bottom of page 31. He says the problem with the Prachekha Buddhas and the Shravakas is their, their aspiration is off. And on the bottom of of 31 he, here he says such a practitioner with Hinayana attitude will never attain Buddhahood unless he changes his aspiration and that's what he's talking about here in a way all of this is talking about changing our aspiration not not aspiring to escape but aspire, aspiring to see in a different way to um, to take up the life of all of these different beings rather than just my own kind of personal idea about what I need or what my liberation is. Um, and that's not, so, that's not so hard to understand. I mean, it's not easy to do or to really invest that way. But um, I think we intuitively, we intuitively know, know that. That bodhicitta or bodhi mind, um, that is the path of the bodhisattva. And that's why those, those last two of the ten realms, the bodhisattva and the Buddha, those are not um, uh, stuck. They're not conditioned by the transmigration. They're actually saying, no, the transmigration is our home. That's where we do our work. Buddhas simply illuminate the whole thing and bodhisattvas work to meet beings in their specific circumstances to help them over, overcome. Sir, mm -hmm. what does bodhi mean? Awakening. So it's awakening. Yeah, awakening. So Buddha means awakened one and bodhi is the awakening. Um, it gets, you know, Bodhi in English gets translated a lot of different ways. Like sometimes it's translated as enlightenment, sometimes awakening, sometimes verification. Some, there's different words in English that are used for what was, you know, originally, you know, one term. We say like the Bodhi tree. So that's a tree of enlightenment. A Bodhisattva is an enlightened being, a being that's, that's headed uh, you know, is, lives their, their life is a, based on the bodhi mind or the bodhicitta, um, aiming for full enlightenment. Does that mean that uh, Bodhidharma, the ancestor, that was an honorific name, not his real name? Yeah, so Bodhidharma would have been his dharma name. Yeah, so Bodhidharma would be enlightened, enlightened dharma or enlightened teaching. Yeah, yeah. People always have these great names. You know. My name means embracing purity, which... Uh, I thought it was really hilarious when my teacher gave it to me. <laughs> but I also came to, I mean, I guess it's kind of relevant here. What I came, I came to think of it as being like uh, bear-hugging the universe. You know, purity in Buddhism doesn't mean, doesn't mean uh, like get rid of the bad stuff and keep the good stuff. Purity means the um, um, non-separateness. So that's kind of what we're talking about here. Yeah. The hell realm is also pure essentially. Not much fun. Pure. But pure. <laughs> pure. So, you guys want to now have some real fun? I, I promised you lists of interpenetrating dharma. And you've barely gotten there, but we have one. So now in this next se section, he's saying, okay, so this is what bodhisattvas do. This is what bodhisattvas do. Rising of this mind, this different kind of mind, the aspiration is different. The aspiration is for full enlightenment, which includes um, all beings, not just ourself. And when that aspiration shifts, there's something we do. And that is uh, we receive and live through the three pure precepts. And then he uses the three pure precepts to talk about what is the life um, of a bodhisattva and um, he uses these I don't you know I love Okumura Roshi's translating and then when I'm working with the text I'm like why did he translate it that way which I think is just what happens when when it's not, you didn't do the translation I think that's just how it is you're just you're just caught in that and if if, if, if someone used my translation 
um, then I would have thought they'd do a good job. <coughs> but he uses um, good deeds. Um, keeping precepts. This is his way. I mean, he uses more language, but I don't want to write it all, all up. So these are his ways of languaging out the three pure precepts. We usually use the term embrace, which is much more literal translation from the Chinese. And I think it just makes more sense. Embrace good dharma or teachings. That's one of them. Again, this isn't the typical order, but he's, he's using this order because he's going to relate it to some other things. And then we say embrace codes and forms. This is a little bit of a tricky one. Here it says keep precepts. Codes and forms here primarily means um, things that, uh, that um, um, limit our behavior. So sometimes gets translated as ceasing from evil, which is a very loose translation, but it basically means putting a limit on our exercise of greed, hate, and delusion, that we've got to do that. We, we exercise it too freely, and we need something that says no. Okay, that's the embracing the codes and the forms. The codes and the forms are those um, insights and regulations, whereas embracing good dharmas is embracing the teachings um, that... Um, take us in a good direction. So this could be like ceasing the negative aspects of greed, hate, and delusion, and this is embracing the good aspects of greed, hate, and delusion. You can see it that way. And of liberation. And then we usually say, last one then, is, is embracing living beings. So he has these couple pages where he's talking about these as being the basis of the bodhisattva life. And that's just, you know, that's something that we study here um, a lot because uh, precepts are so central to um, this particular school um, of Buddhism. But he goes on to talk a little bit more about these as being um, a certain kind of antidote. So he says that this, this one, embracing good dharmas or good deeds, that this transforms greed. He says greed functions in a different way when we embrace um, good, when we embrace good dharmas. That uh, trying to make things better and trying to get what we want through this precept of embracing good dharmas, it can direct that in a way that is liberating for ourselves um, and others rather than simply getting what we want, or making things better in a kind of conventional sense. He says that the codes and forms, this um, transforms anger. Or, he says more precisely, anger will function in a different way when lived through the precepts of, of um, uh, embracing codes and forms. And that ignorance will function in a different way Um, when uh, uh, we live through the um, precept of embracing living beings. And then he further goes on to say we call that different functioning the virtues of the Buddha or the virtues of the Tathagata. And this one then becomes wisdom. This one is exhausting. Um, afflictions, is that how it is? Delusion. And this one is compassion. So these are virtues of So what he's doing here is starting to tell us about what is the language that we use to talk about the way that this luminosity of the Buddha mind functions in um, a life of the Bodhisattva. 
it's actually functioning through uh, us and it gets it gets played out as greed, anger, and ignorance um, in a diluted way, but it also the precepts can allow that same that same greed, anger, and delusion to transform as wisdom exhausting of delusion and compassion and that that's what we call the path so that if we simply get rid of these things or we think what we're going to do is get rid of greed hate and delusion no path really appears not the path of the bodhisattva anyway because we don't have any way to really uh, function there and so this this kind of way of relating you know, we have three different things here we have the 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 guidelines of a bodhisattva life, which he's summarizing as the three pure precepts. Notice these aren't, these aren't um, behavioral restrictions. That's not how they're formulated. The three pure precepts, when you get to the 10 grave precepts, that's like, don't kill, don't steal, don't steal, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, but, but here, that's not what the precepts are about. And that's, that's a big thing. It, oftentimes people think of precepts as only being like, you know, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. But in a tradition, the precepts, the bodhisattva precepts, particularly the, pr the pure precepts, are sending us in a, a way of living. It's a way of talking about the path. So he has those, but he's saying that these things are necessary for them to function, and that they can function as these things. And then he takes one more step, which mostly is just bewildering. And he talks about the Buddha body. So if you've um, engaged the, the teachings of the three kayas or three bodies, the Dharma Kaya, Sambhoga Kaya, and Nirmana Kaya, um, it's a very important and deep teaching, but very, uh, what's the word? It's not just enough to just explain. It's a lot to get into that way of looking at um, what the teachings are. So if this doesn't make much sense, um, don't be too concerned. Usually you have to hear it many times in different contexts for it to start um, gelling in some way. I mean, that's true of all teachings, but this one in particular. So in the teachings about the Buddha body, um, says that there are three layers to the body of a Buddha. And there's three ways we can talk about the, the body of, of a Buddha. And the um, the fundament or the, the way that we oftentimes think about it is called a corresponding body. This is the nirmana kaya. And that is a Buddha body that appears in relationship to the deluded lives of living beings to help them wake up to their fundamental mind. So this is like, for example, Shakyamuni Buddha, who was born in South Asia 2,500 years ago. So there's a there's a body, a, a a body that appears to respond in these very in particular circumstances. Okay. So Menzon saying that this compassion, <coughs> which is a kind of transformation of ignorance, which is the embracing of living beings. That, we could understand that as the corresponding body of the Buddha. That illumination of the Buddha um, doesn't show up as some kind of abstract light. It is the body of the Buddha that, that came here and now lives as the body of the teachings that the, that the Buddha um, left, etc. Very tangible. Mm -hmm. That this level is the reward body or the sambhogakaya. And this is the body of the Buddha that is in um, uh, uh, it's called the reward body, sometimes the bliss body because it's the body of the Buddha which is just in perfect illumination. It's the, it's the, the body of the Buddha that's referred to at the beginning of this text that, com that totally self-illuminates itself. Uh, Self, um, and that this um, uh, this body also teaches beings, but doesn't appear in these kind of specific circumstances in the same way.
but appears as um, truths that are um, not bound in those particular circumstances. So for example, the traditional way of talking about a teaching like the Lotus Sutra is that the Lotus Sutra is taught by a Sambhogakaya Buddha. So we don't try to understand the Buddha in that sutra as the Nirmanakaya Buddha that lived in South Asia at that time, but it is a, it's another body of the Buddha. Sometimes people refer to these, um, the bodies of the Buddha here and bodies of bodhisattvas, etc., as subtle bodies. So the subtle body would be a realm that is um, not um, as uh, solid in the conventional sense. Um, but here, Buddhas still personify. So they still show up as Amida Buddha or Shakyamuni Buddha or all of these different Buddhas. That there's a personification of, of Buddhahood. Um, I don't mean someone just makes up the idea of a person. I mean that the Buddha is a person, but the person there is not a person in the way that we th think about personhood in our conventional sense. That's the Nirmanakaya. And that this body of the Buddha uh, exhausts delusion. That our anger, right, that things are not the way they're supposed to be, which is also our conviction about truth. It's like the passion of wanting things to be right. right? That, that that is misguided in a way. But as we, as we keep it under check and we practice, right? we practice the path then delusion is exhausted by that, by that body. That's the, the way uh, Menzon's presenting it. And that then the, the um, how did he translate truth? Oh, he just said Dharma. Sometimes people will say the truth body or the Dharma Kaya. Kaya means body. The Dharma body. And this is the Buddha that has no shape or color and um, is everything, is also the eternally abiding Dharma body of the Tathagata, which he references in a, a number of places. And that this body is the body of wisdom. And that body of wisdom means there's no inside or outside, which is the delusion of greed. But greed also is saying there shouldn't be a separation here. Right? But greed thinks there's an outside and an inside. And we get the outside stuff to the inside. That's what we're trying to do with greed. Right? Get it, like get it in me as food or get it as my possession or my circumstances or whatever, trying to nail it down. Right? That impetus within greed that there shouldn't be a separation is important. But when it functions in that way, it just creates more suffering. Um, as, it's, as it's lived through the embracing of good dharmas, then the wisdom functioning of it is that there never was any separation. There is only the dharmakaya. There's only the truth body of the Buddha everywhere. So I realize that's a little out there, but that's this kind of matrix like this where we end up with um, these four sets of three. When you see things like that um, showing up in the teachings where they're pointed out by the teacher, um, uh, in particularly in a text like this, they exist to help us start thinking about something in another way because we tend to isolate these different notions. And in their isolation, we're not quite sure how they function. But more than isolating, we tend to oppose them. right? So we oppose greed, anger, and ignorance, which is the reason he's putting it here specifically, is we greed, anger, and ignorance get opposed to these bodies of the Buddha. They get opposed to the virtues of the Buddha. They get opposed to this. And we think that keeping these precepts means getting rid of greed, anger, anger, and delusion. And he's saying that's, um, um, that's a mistake. Uh -huh. Why, 
I'm always been confused about why reward. Mm -hmm. Why, why mm. the Sambhogakaya is the reward body? It's also why sometimes it's bliss bodies, it's different ways, the, the, there's a few different characters that you use in Chinese too for it. But in the, when we call it the reward body, it usually is because it's starting to stack this way, that the practice of a Buddha um, in the kind of more uh, uh, manifest way um, has uh, a body of reward which develops from that. So sometimes we'll say that the practice and the Nirmanakaya level um, develops the body of bliss, which is a reward body. So I think that's where the term, that's where the term will, uh, would come from. It also sometimes is referred to as a, um, a response body, which is different than the corresponding body. It's a kind of teaching, teaching body. So now look at the bottom of page 34. So I've basically, you know, what I'm talking through here is what he explains in a few paragraphs. Um, and then on the page of the 34 where he's trying to bring up, you know, what's the significance of all of this? That very last sentence that starts with finally. He says, finally, there are some who use their minds and all realms wherever they are for the practice of the three pure precepts, or we could say for walking the bodhisattva path. So see how different that is from escaping from transmigration. There are some who use their minds in all realms, which are the same thing, right? Because all realms and the mind are not separate. Um, wherever they are, for the practice of uh, the three pure precepts. And then he uses, he has this um, image of the person mm. where he says, you know, an astringent person, and uh, it's very astringent. <coughs> you, if you let it soften, then it becomes sweet. But if you just focus on squeezing the astringency out of the person, then you never get the sweetness. And that's a kind of image for the bodhisattva's attitude or the bodhisattva's aspiration um, to, to see the world in that way rather than just uh, getting rid of something. remembered that I did. Hmm. I I you have a flashlight? And a phone. A phone flashlight? This is worth it, trust me. <laughs> This was given to me by the Sangha 
on the 10th anniversary of my ordination, which was, um, I don't know, not quite 20 years ago. And uh, those of you who've been around for a while, when you would come to Psalm then, this was hanging in my office for a very long time. So it's you know it's small. I'll leave it up when class is finished. You can come up and look at it too. Um, but this is what we've been talking about, and this is it lined out um, in a iconographical way. Here in the middle are the three poisons, which are symbolized by the pig, and the snake, and the and the um, uh, chicken, or a rooster. And then there's the negative karmic movements and the positive karmic movements. And then these are the six realms of transmigration. And this is the 12 link chain of dependent origination, which is around the outside. Technically in Mahayana, we should say the 12 link chain of interdependent origination, but we don't need to talk about that right now. It's just a little fun fact whenever you say that you can remember. And here's Lord Yama that's holding, um, holding the mirror. And the Buddha and <coughs> Bodhisattvas that are um, depicted here as both outside of that circle, but we know, remember I've said a lot of times, circles mean there aren't really an edge. And then you'll see that's a Buddha in each one of the realms. And um, this isn't always there. Um, I didn't know that the, the this was <coughs> happening, but my wife, Alsa, she asked me clever questions about, about this and why I was interested in it, to find out the one that I wanted. I didn't know what she was doing, so it was, really, it was quite a surprise. Mm -hmm. And these, um, uh, uh, the one with the Buddha in each realm, when it doesn't have the Buddha in each realm, it doesn't make sense to me. That there's like, the image breaks in some way. Mm -hmm. So, the Buddha is appearing in each of these realms. You could say that's a Dharmakaya or a Nirmanakaya Buddha that's appearing in the hell realm to help the, the, the hell beings, um, etc. And, um, uh, and that, that kind of specific quality of each of the Buddhas in those realms speak to how the Buddha would show up. But always that showing up has to do with compassion. Right? That's the quality of the Nirmanakaya Buddha is to show up uh, as compassion. And the uh, Dharmakaya is showing his wisdom. And the exhausting of delusion is the Sambhavakaya. That's how the Sambhavakaya is showing up. Which was so different than, you know, I was kind of grew up spiritually to try to be good. And, um, but I couldn't be because of original sin. <laughs> Which has its own, I don't mean to uh, degrade that, but just say that's a very different circular way of thinking about things than the general way that um, I thought of. Another interesting thing to think about that is it is transmigration. So um, did how many, I'm sure some of you must have gone to, as many years ago at the U of O, they had a hell scroll exhibit, you, a few people here. And um, um, the Chinese, uh, very um, um, interesting and old paintings about hell was also very common in Japan. The hell scrolls were really important. I think part of it was just like, you know, horror movies are interesting to people. And so that was a certain level of it was kind of entertainment. And, and I don't know about in China, but in Japan, these hell scrolls would travel around. So there would be these you know, gruesome depictions of hell and they would travel from temple to temple and people would come from all around to see to see these hell um, scrolls. And um, so they had this exhibit of those and some other, uh, some other things exhibited at the same time. But the um, hell scroll, if you looked at it, one of the, if you looked at them, one of the things that um, so different than the hell that I grew up with was there's an entrance and an exit. So, and then there are the administrators of hell. Lord Yama in this kind of iconography looks kind of like a beast. But in the Chinese iconography, it looks like a bureaucrat. Mm -hmm. 
which <laughs> at first blush, you're like, well, yeah, that seems like hell to me. Um, but actually the meaning of that is that it's not, it's like, look, there's an order to this. There's a law. There's a way in which this plays out. Your karma is like a system of regulations that are not human-made regulations, but are a fundamental law. And so Lord Yama is not a bad guy in the court of the, of the, the kings of, of hell are not bad. They're just the administrators of karma, basically. And so you would see, you know, the, the, the order of the thing, there are those you, you, people coming in front of these panels and then they're being led away into different qualities of hell, different, different functions of hell. And then, and then they got to spend time there before they can move on to another place. Right? Mm. Um, uh, but that's true of all of the realms. So even the, the opposite of the hell realm, which is the divine realm, which is a very wonderful place to be. It's the top of the top of good karma. Um, but it's still marked by ignorance, which means it's still, in, it's still transmigrating. And so that transmigration means that those divine beings, even though they may be there for kalpas, unfathomable lengths of time, they tend towards the disembodied and the forgetting of suffering. So this you can find in the story of the Buddha, for example, that the Buddha's last incarnation, the Buddha Shakyamuni's last incarnation before appearing in our world was an incarnation in the Tushita heaven, which is uh, a heaven of complete contentment. And it's said that all Buddhas, that's, that they, they, they have their, their uh, second to last incarnation there. My theory about that is they need to rest up. <laughs> And they need to know that um, actually the saving of beings is not an accomplishment. Like they need to know of the contentment of that. This is just my conjecture or my feeling about it. So that they can come into the presence of the world not trying to push things around. Because if they try to push things around that they, they can't really accomplish Buddhahood. Um, so, uh, so a lot of beautiful stories there. That's why we say that uh, that is the place that the Shakyamuni Buddha learned many things. And in the Segaki ceremony we just had a couple of weeks ago, um, that's where he learns from Avalokiteshvara about what it means to feed hungry ghosts. Right? So, and then Avalokiteshvara shows up as a hungry ghost to one of his um, closest disciples when he's um, here on um, earth. So, so that's another reason to know these things, because the stories of the tradition, um, they live within this cosmology. And so the, um, when we know a little bit about what, how things are marked, what they're marked by, etc., it lets us understand the mythology more um, completely. When we don't understand that, sometimes the mythology just seems weird. Um, um, and it may still seem weird, but at least you have a little bit of reference. Okay. Good. Yeah. So next week will be the last class and we will do everything else. Except for we won't do all the Dogen pieces at the end. So th those are for you after we finish the class to enjoy over Thanksgiving break and Christmas break and whatever else that you might celebrate around the holidays and you can just read uh, Gigi is on my quotes from Dolan and you won't even need any presents.